So our reading this morning is from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 32. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the, pi that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, is because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Oh, man. Graham, thank you so much. Uh, our speaker today is Emily Lazell. Emily is my wife, so I'm slightly biased, uh, but she is absolutely amazing. Uh, together we lead the church here, and uh, we have four sons. And uh, again, I really want to just welcome those who, you're not normally here on a Sunday, and just to say Emily's going to speak for about 20 minutes. So would you give a warm welcome to Emily as she comes to speak? The table, please. Uh, Martin, was that a public, you've got 20 minutes, don't go over, I've told everybody, I hear you, I hear you. Um, yeah, so I, I actually didn't grow up going to church. Um, I, th I think I believed in God when I was younger, um, but it wasn't until I was about 15 um, that I had this experience, this encounter, where I met with Jesus through his Holy Spirit, and that my original sort of perception of God is this distant um, sort of detached um, being that was indifferent perhaps to me and to my life, that that all totally changed. As from that point on, why I encountered Jesus through his Holy Spirit, the whole narrative from that point on of my life changed. There's a saying, tell me the facts and I'll learn. Tell me the truth and I'll believe. Tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. Now Jesus was the master storyteller. And uh, that story in the Gospel of Luke that Graham just read for us is possibly the greatest short story ever told. Now, stories are powerful, are they? In whatever medium you listen to a story, we can watch films in the cinema, and you can watch them at 2D, 3D, 4DX. If you go, I've never been to a 4DX, but I hear, if you go into the cinema, 4DX film, but your seat's not working, you miss out on the experience, like the full experience, because, you know, the whole motion of the seat changing. If you go into a 3D, watch a 3D film, and you don't have these special glasses, you miss out, don't you, on actually the whole point of the story, because it's these glasses in a 3D film, which mean that you're fully um, immersed into the story into a whole new way. Giving time 
to look at the context of this story that was read to us, to look at the setting, who is being spoken to, that's like us putting on 3D glasses. It's the equivalent. So that's what we're going to spend a bit of time doing to help us bring the action of this story to life. And this story um, is one through which, the glasses through which we view this story is ancient Middle Eastern culture. You had the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the religious people at the time, and they had a massive problem with Jesus hanging out with sinners. So Jesus, in this story, he's responding to their complaint. He's responding to them by telling them a story. And this story's got three main characters. The man, who represents God, the older brother, who represents the Pharisees, and the younger son, who represents sinners. You've got this younger son. He basically goes to his dad and he asks for his share of the inheritance. Now, in this culture, that request is pretty dishonoring, pretty hard to hear, but especially in the Middle Eastern culture, because it was like going up to his dad and saying the equivalent of, I wish you were dead. It was a shameful request. And in this strong honor, shame culture, the expected response of the father would have been to have thrown the son out. But this father didn't respond like that. He gives his son what he asks for. Having heard of that introduction to the story, Jesus' listeners are leaning in. They're really leaning in because they're thinking, gosh, this father, what kind of father is this? This father takes two emotional hits. First, the shame of his son even asking, and secondly, going through with his request. His listeners are thinking, what kind of a father is this? In verse 13, it says, not long after that, so the son acts quickly. The younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country. He sells his inheritance for cash. Because obviously, you can't take your property with you. So we know that he must have sold um, all his inheritance. And the fact that he left nothing to come back for is, is evidence. It suggests that he had no intention of returning. He had no intention of doing what he should have done, which was to come back and look after his father when his father would have been old. And that's what would have been expected. So this piles on even more shame onto the father. Now, traditionally in that culture, the older son would have inherited um, three quarters of the estate, the younger son a quarter. And uh, as he's taken his estate, obviously, as he can't take his estate with him, he sells it. So imagine the, the family situation now. You are living and owning a house, difficult to imagine, I know in London. Imagine, just stretch it. Imagine that you own this house, you own this property, and you're having to sell off um, a, a quarter of that to somebody else, to a complete stranger. So you're having to adjust your whole life, your whole way of living. And every day, somebody else living in that part of your property is this daily reminder of shame of what the younger son has done. And why the hurry? It could have been that it was just super awkward, hanging around the house, thinking, I've got to get out of here. But it wasn't just the home that the younger son had to worry about. It was the entire village. Because once they had heard about the son's requ request, which is akin to denying his whole family line, once the whole community would have heard that, their anger would have stirred. And Jesus is telling this story. At this point, those listening would have the Kezazar ceremony in the back of their minds. Now, the Kezazar is a Jew Jewish ceremony, ceremony. It literally means cutting off. So when a former member of the village goes away and then spends all their money on, um, with Gentiles and then tries to return to the village, he would be met at the village boundary, at the gate, by the entire people of the community. They would take this large clay pot, which was filled with burnt corn and nuts, and they would smash it into thousands of pieces, symbolizing this cutting off, symbolizing this separation, and marking him as an outcast. So, mindful of the anger rising in the village, the younger son legs it. And he goes a long way from home, and he spends his money on wild living. And perhaps a better translation of the word in the original Greek would be extravagant, or wasteful, or expensive living. We know the money runs out. There's a severe famine in the whole country. 
the younger son is in need. He has done the unthinkable. He's lost his inheritance to the Gentiles, and he knows that the Kesar ceremony is awaiting him if he were to return, unless he can find a paying job, recoup the money and all that was lost, and go back. In a way, could anything be any worse for him? Then he gets a job feeding the pigs. Now, I love a good word association game. And um, uh, what do you think of when you think of the word pig? I mean, maybe you're thinking like another animal, like cow or lunch or I don't know. Um, now, my name before I got married, my surname before I got married, my last name was Trotter. And my dad, no need to laugh, that's a bit rude. And, uh, and my dad was a police officer. And so I might sometimes have people in my local village go, hey, Trotter, your dad's a pig. And I just think, very funny, very original, thank you so much. Um, but what about you? What are the things that come to mind for you when you think of the word pig? When I asked that question to one of um, my sons, they said Percy, Percy pigs. And I thought, well, that's quite a good choice. Um, and it, who likes Percy pigs? Who wants Percy pigs? Who wants Percy pigs? Who's got some children that need entertaining whilst I'm talking? Um, no, go on, who's gonna, uh, there we go, you put your hand up and you're close. So it gets a guaranteed catch. Oh, there we go, that's a good father, isn't it? Um, but for this, for in this situation, um, pigs were, um, were bad. For Jews, any association with pigs was terrible. It, there was no animal that was more disgusting, and they were considered unclean, the ultimate symbol of loathing. They wouldn't eat them. They wouldn't go anywhere near them. So we're knowing in this, we're finding out in this story that this son has not only lost all his inheritance to the Gentiles, he's now working with pigs. He's feeding the pigs. And he's even longing to eat what the pigs were eating. He really had gone as far, far away from his community, his family, and his father as he could possibly get. Finally, he comes to his senses. And uh, as is so often in any stories, I don't know if there's any filmmakers here in the house, there's this bit where the character tells us his motive. He says, I'm starving to death. This sums up really what's going on. It's like talking to himself in a field. And uh, I imagine it's a bit like a, a, you know, a film director saying to, you know, to some, like Miranda Hart, you know how she does her show, look to camera sort of thing. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. At first glance, reading this, it looks like he's hit rock bottom. He realizes the error of ways, and he decides to hem, head home humbled and repentant. That's what it appears like. But this is where we need the 3D glasses. This is where that kicks in, the context, because the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who were listening to Jesus telling this story, they knew the scriptures really well. And so the line in this story, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you, was very well known to them. And it was the exact phrase that Pharaoh said to Moses when he was trying to manipulate Moses into stopping the plagues. We can read about it in Exodus chapter 10, verse 16. Everybody knew in that story that the Pharaoh wasn't repenting. He just wanted the plagues to stop. That was his motivation. The son, the son's statement was the same. He wasn't plagued by sin. See what I did there? Plagues, plagues. Um, I'm here all day. I, I'm not here all day. I know it's super hot. Um, and it, he was being manipulative. He was still looking out for number one. His motivation and his motive wasn't repentance, but it was for refreshments. And verse 17, if you look at it, it reveals that he knows that his father's workers had what they needed and food to spare. He knows what's that's before him. So he makes a plan to go back to his father in the capacity of an employee. So he works out this speech to try and soften the anger of the father. He has three lines. He says, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And then comes in the request, can I come on staff? It's a bit like when one of my sons says, I've done my homework, I've tidied my room, can I ever go on screens? You know, it's building up to that request. He's thinking that if he can recover the lost money through working for his father, then he would have earned his way back. That if he could pay back the debt, then he could restore himself. So verse 20 says, so he got up and went to his father. 
How did his father respond? Well, it says while he was still a long way off, so we know that they didn't just bump into each other. The father would have been watching, scanning the horizon, looking for his son to appear. It says his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. So he didn't know what his son was going to say, but he was filled with compassion just at the sight of him. And he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and he kissed him. I imagine this like movie style moment. The father running downhill, because it's easier, downhill through this long grass. It's golden hour. You know, the beautiful evening sunlight lighting up, soft focus on the camera. The orchestra building to a crescendo as he runs to meet his son. But with our 3D glasses on, looking at this Middle Eastern cultural context, that helps us see the reality of this scene. First, those listening to the story would have been expecting this clay pot moment. They would have been expecting the Kezazar ceremony. So this is an unexpected twist in the story that the father goes running out to him. Second, a dignified Jewish man would never run. They wore long robes, so he, to, to be able to run, he would have had to have hitched up his robes, exposing his knees, which again was shameful for someone of his position. His, his actions made him look foolish and bringing shame on himself once again. But the father runs because he knows that if the community get there first, they would perform this Kezazar ceremony and his son would be cut off and humiliated. He has to get there first. So the father chooses to be humiliated himself to bring his son home. What kind of a father is this? The son begins his speech, but he doesn't complete it. Not because the father interrupts him, but because in the father's embrace, he encounters his love and accepts being found Now let's not forget, this is all happening at the edge of the village. So this is like super public. Then the father says to the servants, verse 22, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Now the robe is symbolic, a dis, a, um, like state, represents status and honor and distinction. It would have been the best robes are probably only saved for um, occasions like the feast days. His shame was being covered in that moment. The ring symbolized a signet ring, it represented authority, so the son could act on the father's behalf, sealing letters and documents with hot wax. And sandals, slaves and servants went barefoot, but sons wore sandals. In all this, the father is completely restoring and reinstating the son in full view of the community. And knowing the depth of acceptance that the father extends to the son, the community for the sake of the father, now will also accept the son. They celebrate by killing the fattened calf and having a party. The son deserved rejection, but he gets reconciliation and he gets a reception. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Then we get to the older brother. So he's on his way home from work. He's been in the field. He approaches the house. He hears the party. And as he gets nearer, he calls one of the servants who tells him what's happening older brother gets angry, refuses to go in. So he goes to his father and he pleads with him. So his father goes out and pleads with him. The older son doesn't listen. He's having a massive strop. He moans about not having as much food as his brother or as food as he'd like to have with his friends. He accuses the father of favoritism. He's raging out of control. He can't even bring himself to speak about his brother as his brother because in verse 30 it says, this son of yours He's disassociating himself, and he accuses him with sleeping with prostitutes. In this moment, the older brother, the older son, is revealing his belief that he thinks he's got to earn his way to the father in some way. And in all this, he's being as equally disrespectful to the father as the younger son had been, because this is all in view of everyone. The father in this moment Who'd have thought, you know, I've had it up to here with you guys. You are a nightmare. You know, it's like, dealt with your younger brother, and now I'm dealing with you. How does he respond in this moment? He doesn't respond with anger, but he instead responds with love. And he says, come and join the party. What kind of a father is this? And like any good story, this one's left on a cliffhanger. How will the older brother respond? 
how will the younger son behave from now on? And sometimes when you read the Bible, when you read a biblical story like this, it's an invitation for us to invite ourselves to see ourselves in the story. Where do we fit in this story? You know, we all make mistakes. And the younger brother, the younger son made mistakes and then tried to earn his way back. The older brother made the mistake of thinking that even his, in his father's house, he had to earn his love. In a sense, they were both lost. And sometimes this story is called the lost sons, plural. On one childhood family holiday in Wales, we decided to go for, um, for a walk. We always did circular walks. You know, we never could just go somewhere. And to this day, I, I can't stand walks where you just literally go in one line and back again. It just feels totally wrong. So always did circular walks. And we're in this woods in Wales. And my brother and I, I would have been 10. My brother was 11. I think we're probably annoying our parents a little bit. So they just said, why don't you guys go on, scout out the journey, lead ahead. So we went off and... Um, we just sort of went, went, went ahead of them. After a little while, we looked back, and we couldn't see them with us at all, neither my, my mum, my dad, or, or my other siblings. And so we waited. And we waited. And we waited. And they still didn't come. And I just thought, goodness, this is taking ages. So I said, why don't we retrace our steps? So we went back down the path that we'd origin where we'd originally seen them, when we'd last seen them. And they, we couldn't find them anywhere. Now, at this point, quite a bit of time had passed, and we were beginning to get a bit worried. And to make matters worse, it started to get dark, and it started to rain. And so we were there in this woods, lost at this point, running back and forth down all these paths, trying to find our family. We were drenched. We were totally soaked. And um, I remember one point, you know, running through a puddle and my shoe had got sucked into it. So I ended up like running out of it and then having to hop back going back, back through the, the puddle to go and pick my shoe up. We were in a panic. We were now cold, wet, seriously dirty, pretty upset and utterly lost. Then we heard this sound and we heard this noise. It was our dad. He was running, running around the woods. And we'd realized that because of the way that this um, walk, stupid walk, was marked out, um, there was like a footprint on these wooden posts, and the angle of the footprint determined which path you should take. And it was a bit ambiguous. So we had taken the wrong path. And when my dad knew that we were lost, he then spent so much time running round and round the woods trying to find us. So by the time, he was quite a big guy. So by the time he came to us, we could hear these thunderous footsteps coming towards us. He was totally drenched, drenched in sweat, drenched in the rain. And as he found us, he dropped to his knees and he just held us. And after a few moments, I just said, Dad, can we go now? And he just said, wait, let me just hold you. Let me just hold you. God's love for me and God's love for you is like that, but far, far greater. And this story in Luke's gospel is about God's amazing grace. For those of us who have gone off, whether deliberately gone away from God, and for those of us who've never left his house who've maybe always been brought up in church, as it were, and yet you somehow still feel lost. What kind of a father is this? This story in some translations is also called the running father. He's the father that runs to us. Johnny Mackesy, who's an artist, author, and filmmaker of the boy, the mole, the fox, and the horse, he depicted this story of the prodigal son as a bronze statue and also as a painting he drew the prodigal son and the prodigal daughter. And I'm just going to read out the text from the prodigal daughter, which is written behind one of these. Um, you can get cards of them, actually, but written behind. It says, this is the story of the prodigal daughter. It should really be called the running father, who waited every day for his girl to come home. The daughter who had rejected him so badly. But when, she saw her, when he saw her from a long way off, he ran to her and hugged her and kissed her. God is a father who looks for you, motivated by love. He runs to you wherever you are. And filled with compassion and love, he forgives completely and wholly 
and he clothed you with dignity and honor. It is through Jesus that we can know God, our Heavenly Father. Jesus went to the cross. He took our sin. He took my sin. He took your sin, the sin of the world, all our guilt, all our shame. He chose to be humiliated for our sake. Jesus was cut off from the Father because God is holy and he can't look on sin. And he did it so that we wouldn't ultimately be cut off but could come home to the Father. Wherever you're at today, whether you're presenting really well in church and nobody would know what's going on inside, or whether you've turned up here and you are just at the end of yourself and you feel lost, whatever you've done, know this morning that you are a child of God. You cannot earn it. You are loved. And so the question for us today is how will you respond to this love. Let's pray.